Welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of the Art Brunch Archives. Every week on Twitch, we bring in a new contemporary artist to talk about their work, have a couple bevs, and hang out. I'm the host of Art Brunch, Rick Bowling. We'll be joined shortly by my co-host, Jake Leach. The most recent Art Brunch episodes are exclusively on Twitch for two weeks. But every week, we upload an edited show to podcast and to YouTube. Here on YouTube, we host just the art part of the conversation, so you can see which images we're referring to. But if you want to hear the crazy, like, canned crucible segment in the beginning, or the ten questions of triumph at the end, you're going to have to go check that out in the podcast. Please take a moment to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And consider checking out our Twitch, making a Twitch account if you don't have one, going and following the travel agency, hanging out with our awesome live community on Twitch. It's a good way to create connection in a time where connection can be hard to find. And it's the way the show's intended to be. All of these links and more are available in the description below. Our guest this week, really exciting guest, Emily Strimming. I've admired her work for a long time, and it was an awesome opportunity to chat with her. Her bio reads, Emily G. Strimming is an artist and fine art photographer residing in St. Louis, Missouri. Her work emphasizes medium specificity and pushes the boundaries of what makes a photograph art. Her work goes beyond the whole idea of a photograph being a reproducible print by creating actual art objects. Emily physically slices into archival prints, while at the same time covering the entire print with her fingerprints as she weaves together inkjet images. Every piece is unique and therefore unreproducible. Her images from far away appear to be pixelated, playing with the ideas of digital image, becoming a tangible work of art, created not only by a machine, but with her own two hands. She uses a variety of techniques, including both digital and analog distortion, and conceptually touches on the psyche of victims of domestic violence and intimidation. Her work often revolves around imagery of women integrated with imagery of weapons of destruction. Emily got her BFA at SIUE and worked as an assistant director at Duet Gallery in St. Louis from 2014 to 2018. Her work has been shown at local galleries and downtown spaces such as MX and Anged Arts Hotel. She has work in the Satellite Fair at the Miami Basel in 2017 and will be featured in a group show in the UK in December 2020. Thanks for watching as always and enjoy the show. We can start with some of these. Um, you kind of gave me like a lineage of your work. So we'll be working mm -hmm. from um, some of the first things that you showed me up into the present here. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm curious kind of where this started or, or when, when this work started to be made or started taking place. Yeah, so the trans, these are what I call photo transfers. Mm -hmm. And these are before the weaving. Um, and this was in a class that was called serial imagery. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, our projects would be paper based, but you could do like whatever you wanted. And I was also in the photography class. And I think like around this time, I started to cut into my photography images and like make collages with them. And mm -hmm. then I started weaving them. But this was when we were like, we started talking about like photo theory and like what a photograph even is. Mm -hmm. And so um, going along with that, like photography is a, um, it's, it's not like painting, it's like more of a means of documentation. Mm -hmm. And it didn't even really become an art form until the 1970s. So, I mean, it is a technology and that's what makes it so interesting because with painting, it's like obviously a representation of something, mm -hmm. but 
photography is you're it's a technology and you're taking something from the real world but it also can be distorted into a representation mm -hmm. so that's when you get into uh when you when you start talking about what is is this photograph art basically or is mm -hmm. it just like a means of documentation mm -hmm. totally like Susan Sontag said, like like a photograph is inevitably a uh, sort of co like co ops whatever its image is and kind of reforms it into that of a photograph. Like you're inevitably kind of taking over that space inherently. Yeah, yeah and also, oh sorry, go ahead. No, <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, there there is. I was just going to reiterate that there is the the utilitarian aspect of it that is in the forefront of a lot of our minds, but then um, somehow it's transmuted. Like there's there's some approach to it that can transmute it from utility into an art space, and that's that's kind of an antiquated view that like art can't involve utility, um, but just just something that came to my mind. For sure. Yeah, so like with this image, basically we're talking a lot about, you know, what what makes a photograph art. Um, and that's when I became really interested in like medium specificity. So I was like really focused on like the actual materials of like making a photograph. Mm. Um because when it comes to, you know, analog, you're in a dark room, but with digital you're basically using this technology and printing out something. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to like play around with the idea of like, okay, well, what can I kind of get away with as being a photograph? Mm -hmm. Because this, like, it it's a photo transfer, but like, to me, this is still photography mm -hmm. in a way. It's just kind of a different, in a different form. And so like, I'm, Basically, at this time, like early on, I was just kind of playing around with different materials. And that's kind of when I was like cutting into the images, too. And like and those were like I was in a photography class and then in this serial imagery class. So I kind of could play around with different materials. And in my photography class, I was cutting into the inkjet prints that I was printing out on a printer. But in this class, I was more using like paper and I was staining the paper and then finding like imagery and kind of like building up the photo transfers on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said simultaneously you're working with a lot of different materials and and I, I guess I'm curious um, if you could explain to us and to our viewers where this like what this uh medium specificity or material specificity means to you or, or what your how it impacted your work or what your draw is is to that so yeah basically um <clears throat> it's it's just a a fancy word for you know playing around with the actual the medium itself so like whatever the material is um like for painters, um, paint would be their medium. Mm -hmm. So if they use it in like a different way, like not on a canvas like you would usually see, but um, I don't know if you've heard of her, but Kennedy Yanko makes these like paint skins. Oh, okay. And so she kind of, I guess she pours out paint and makes this like skin that dries and then she like forms them into sculptures. So, like, that would be another example of medium specificity. Mm, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we... That's a, that's a very common um, contemporary method of art making where you take something that has typically been perceived in, in, in one particular way, like a medium being useful in a particular way and, and starting to explore the materiality and stretch the materiality of, of whatever the technique or processes that you're using until these objects start to transmute or to transform into uh, unique um, kind of like new experiences with the material. And I definitely think that you are getting, 
getting to that place. Yeah. I, I have a story <laughs> if I want to jump in here. It's like, it feels like, you know, if a, ph a photograph is an uh, appropriation of an image inherently, I must think you're appropriating the appropriated image in a way. Like you're, <laughs> you're, you're taking the thing and then adding 12 more layers to it. Like almost like right. literally, but figuratively like 3d sort of. Yeah. And that was something that I had fun with. Um, just, I kind of like bouncing back and forth from like digital to analog. So sure. I'll take like a digital image and, you know, kind of edit it or distort it in some kind of program. And then I'll like re photograph it and then maybe print it out and like do something to it, like the actual paper mm -hmm. and then maybe even put it back in a digital form. And it's just like, basically backing uh bouncing back and forth between digital and analog for sure and i don't know, i also kind of like breaking the rules in photography i guess mm -hmm. um because you're really not supposed to like touch an archival print at all <laughs> and actually yeah. like if you get like a fingerprint on it it's like devalued yeah so it's like I I just like threw that idea out the window and and I just like put my fingerprints over the entire image, but I really just wanted to play around with the actual paper and see what I could make like um, with my hands instead of like all a technology form. Yeah, I wanted to connect something that you said uh, earlier in the show as to like some of your entrance forays into photography you were having these experiences where like through this arbitrary set of objective quote-unquote objective principles that like your photographs weren't high quality your photographs weren't exposed correctly or like you weren't using the technology in this way that um was appropriate but then Later in that part of the conversation, you you told us that you started to really feel like an artist when you started to work into these photographs and and cut into these things. And then I, I'm mm -hmm. I'm curious about kind of like that relationship with photography as uh, a response to having not done it the proper way at first, or or not feeling like a like a draw to that, and just kind of like responding to it by. Um, moving it through these different methods or, or pushing it through these different means of distortion as like, as, I don't know, as kind of like a statement as far as like how photography feels to you. Yeah, it definitely can feel like a little pretentious at times. Like if you're mm -hmm. at an art show and there's white walls and everything is framed. I mean, I have had shows like that and... I, I like having shows like that, but also some of the best shows I've been to are, you know, not a standard white walled space where it's just kind of raw and like things aren't even framed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have respect for that too. And like later on, <laughs> I, I did learn like my skills in the dark room got a lot better. Yeah. But at that point, you know, once you do like nail the actual technique, then you can really play around with it. And I feel like it's, it's, it is more valid. Like I'm not just doing it because I can't get a good exposure now, oh, you yeah. know, like I was mm -hmm. before. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's good. But now like I understand it and I can like, you know, push and pull that yeah, and and being able to, and having reasons to, as to like why you want to expose a photograph to a certain degree, like not just because it's mm -hmm. the proper way to do it, but with you working with these photographs, you know what kind of you know color color scape or grade scape that you're trying to get on the photograph. So like there are additional layers of of meaning and additional layers of like intention to even approaching the development of the photo the photograph in that way which i think is important i took so much time off painting on canvas because i never had a reason i didn't ever feel like i had a reason to paint on canvas and i wanted to move away from it mostly because everyone just expects it um but recently mm -hmm. like as i started to develop 
reasons for painting on canvas, like doing fine detail work and the tooth of the canvas being the optimal surface for the oil paint to grab onto, then it's like, okay, finally I can come back to this <laughs> right. thing that's considered normal, but I have a reason as to why, um, which I think is, yeah, it is really important. Yeah, kind of goes like full circle. Yeah. Then you can, like, I feel like you need to kind of like know the rules and follow the rules first. But mm -hmm. then once you do, then you can start like breaking them and going crazy. But I mean, it kind of like behind you, Rick, mm -hmm. <laughs> is that a, is that a canvas that's kind of been like shredded? Yeah, in a way, this or? is a, a piece by Vaughn Davis. <laughs> He's a St. Louis painter um, and he makes these uh, distressed canvases. Um, so. I was I was lucky to purchase this from him about two years ago, and he he rubs pigments into the canvas, um, rips and tears them, distresses them in, in various ways, and then uh, pin them directly to the wall so they're they're not stretched again. Um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really good. I feel really fortunate to have this piece. Shout out to Vaughn. Yeah, Nippon Tay fan in the chat says, "Wow." What's up, Nippon Tay fan? We got the Nippon Tay fam in here right now. That was the joke we were making <laughs> pre-show. So what's up, y'all? Uh, um, I wanted to zoom in on this piece, though, because I think this, uh, this work here um, starts to talk about the, one of the other major themes in, in your work. And maybe this is uh, an, early, an early foray into the destruction of like, uh, mm -hmm. a woman's image. Um, so there, there's, uh, this woman here who's washing like a, you know, a skirt or a sheet or, or a nightgown or some kind of like dress. And then, uh, you know, then this, this advertisement, <laughs> Nippon Tay fans is wonderful. <laughs> um, this advertisement for this like washing material. And then you're kind of like coming into the surface and like washing this surface or like cleaning this surface or, or like kind of getting into like this this act of violence against this ad or uh or this woman is is kind of my initial read of it. Yes, yeah, so some of, a lot of my early earlier work um I was using like uh imagery of women like being kind of degraded in a way. Mm -hmm. And so like I myself was taking the image and kind of degrading it even more and doing that to the paper as well. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of uh, my first step into like conceptually what I wanted to talk about in my work. And so this one's a little later on when it does become more about domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because before it was kind of like... Uh, just you know women suffering I guess but then it became more narrowed down to like domestic violence mm. and so in that image you just had up which one the, I'm sorry uh, the where she's washing that oh yes she <laughs> yeah you. that one so it's like it's a woman but I, I was using a lot of like old advertisements because a lot of them are very sexist. Mm -hmm. And so it worked with what I was talking about. And so like a lot of ads are for like, you know, housewives that like, Oh, all she wants for Christmas is a washing machine, you mm -hmm. know, so she can, so she can wash her husband's clothes, you know? So She's like washing clothes, but like in the background is like an actual like crime scene. Oh. So this was where my work kind of um, talks more about like domestic violence mm -hmm. and like actual like violence happening to women. Yeah, yeah, and 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 this this image here, I don't know if if this is the in the same vein i mean this is very clearly um violence against women or you know it, it kind of fits into that um sphere as well i think this one gets even more kind of sharp if you can forgive the pun but <laughs> it it really is it's like much more um 
integrated almost like this one kind of has this foreground image that stands mm -hmm. out more and this this background right. crime scene that's kind of like the the secret or like what's behind closed doors and then this one it it brings them into kind of the same the same register as as we start to see how this gets into your weavings as well and we'll get there in a second um mm -hmm. but you you mentioned domestic violence is an important uh concern with your work and um i'm curious if there are are things that you want to share about how that came to be a part of your work or or what you've noticed in yourself and with working in that imagery early on i like personally had never experienced any abuse like as a younger woman um but i did have friends who you know like one very close friend was sexually abused by her father mm. and so like in my art i'm trying to like you know capture like her feelings in it but it it didn't come from a personal place it came from like me an outsider trying to like learn more about how she was feeling and how other women have felt mm -hmm. and then like i was making all this art about women being abused and victims of violence and you know i really never thought that like i would be in that situation because i've always like been the friend who like is there trying to get them out of it and i always thought like that's never going to be me like i i would see it coming and i would just like get out of the relationship mm -hmm. but it actually did happen i was in an abusive relationship and then i like really understood like how it happens and kind of like mm -hmm. how you get stuck and manipulate manipulated and intimidated in a way that it is really really hard to get out of and it's like looking back, it's so strange to me because it's almost like I almost like manifested this into my life because I was like making so much art about it yeah. early on. And, and then it actually happened to me. And when I was in that relationship, like I really did not make any art at all. Mm. I was just like... uh like I went on a hiatus and did not make any art. And then finally I did get out of it. And I remember like very soon after, like, I feel like it was finally done. I went to the art Basel in Miami mm -hmm. and I actually had some work shown there. And that, ex that whole experience was like, I feel like, the biggest turning point in my life for like art and even just like healing and you know growing from that whole experience yeah and so then when i like and even just like being a part of this whole new art scene that i didn't even know existed and that was like that was just an amazing experience and i never like saw art in that way so after that that's when I was like ready to kind of like start making art again. Mm -hmm. And then when I did start making art, it like it, it made more sense to me what I was making because I actually like went through the feelings of like what it felt like to go through an experience, experience like that, like being in an abusive relationship. Yeah. Rick, if you wouldn't mind going back to the, the nylon piece just really quick. Um, so, I'll be honest, as I watched this for the first time, I, I thought that the background uh, was like a coffee stain. And I thought it was more of like a statement on like, oh, like getting stains out of clothes and things of that nature. And it's like, <laughs> no, that's a crime scene. Mm -hmm. Like that's blood. That's what that's yeah. what I'm seeing. Like I, I almost, and like, it almost feels strange to talk about it like in that it's real life experiences, but we're, this is what this art is playing with is that like, I almost feel like as a viewer, what you perceive as coffee you may realize later is actually blood mm. and and kind of in that situation mm -hmm. of like when you're in a situation that you don't necessarily perceive to be or you would never think you would be in a situation like that like you end up sometimes being in that situation despite having been like an ally for instance to like friends or whatever 
Um, so I just I feel like, you know, maybe even if unfortunately retroactively this this piece speaks to that, but I, I feel like like understanding that situation gave me the, like the depth of this piece in particular, like so much more of that, like just and then again, like all of that is photo like ex, you know you're appropriating images on top of that mm -hmm. with not just material physical items but also material experiences, and I think that's uh, incredible to know all of that while seeing this piece in particular yeah 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 i'm glad you brought that up um because i like to make art that is well as far as right now like the collages i'm leaving are pretty like bright and it doesn't necessarily have to be this like dark theme you sure. know and i like i like that about it like if you want to read into it you can but you can also look at it and have your own you know, opinion about it, or it doesn't have to be like this dark. Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't require yeah. it by any means. Yeah. Well, right. And, right. And I, I think that that is also, first of all, I want to thank you for um, sharing about your experiences in this public forum. I think it's, it's really important and, and vulnerable for you to do that. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, if people are, are having those experiences, they feel like they can reach out or they have people to talk to. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the things that comes up for me in, in regards to that specifically is that like that, that trauma or that abuse doesn't also always feel dark when it's taking place. Like there can be like really vibrant aspects of abusive relationships where I think that, um, you know, people can, can feel like everything is fine or like, this is great or like. I'm feeling this yeah. so much that it must be good that I'm like having these feelings, these emotions that I care that like the darkness comes and, and sometimes it's a coffee stain that you realize is blood later, which I, I, I love that <laughs> perspective, Jake and, uh, or chocolate, you know, like yeah. chocolate and blood or like, you know, the, that energy, you know, both of those things like bring us energy, the blood, the coffee, the chocolate, um, but they all have very different feelings and different connotations, yeah. but sometimes, you know, like we can get into these spaces where like the, it's not a knife, but like, it feels like gold, but it feels like death kind of all, all kind of happening at the same time, which is really powerful for me to understand in, in the context of what you were saying about your work now. Yeah. And this one, like. That's interesting because, like, when I look at my work, I know what the image is of. <laughs> but yeah. it's interesting you say, like, gold because that, like, shiny part at the top is actually part of a gun. Mm. Oh, wow. And I don't know if you can I really, can like, now. yeah. But see, like, just looking at it, if you oh, don't yeah. know, you mm -hmm. know, then it's just kind of like an image. You see, like, a, like there's a face there and a hand. Mm -hmm. And it's like a woman like grabbing a man's face and then there's like a gun over his head. Yeah. Well, and it, just the coloring of it, the goldness of it, but also these, these like stars, these look like, you know, gold stars. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. it has this, like you've done well, but then the coloring of, of the woman's face is also like not alive. It doesn't feel like that's a healthy coloring it starts Saturated. to feel starts to feel like bruised <laughs> yeah. and 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 like battered mm -hmm. and and dead uh, like a militaristic aspect to me too like that the stars with a gun reminds me of you know like earning badges you know for honor supposedly but you know these are stars based off of you know things that are representative of violence and and you know state violence in that way too at least that's that's certainly what i i got from this personally mm -hmm. Um, and I think we should talk yeah, about, so, oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah I was just going to say, sometimes I don't even realize it to like, like you're saying her face is kind of like bruised or like maybe she's not even alive. Like it's like, she's blue in the face, mm -hmm. but sometimes I don't even like mean for it to be like that, but it just kind of like turns out that way in the end. And then later I'll look at it. Or like, like you, like someone else will point out that like, oh yeah, like I see this in it. And it's interesting that I'm wondering like that if that like just 
subconsciously like that's what i intended but like didn't even really realize it for sure yeah so then maybe talk about your process and 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 give us some some insight into how you select these things and how you begin to weave them because we've been dancing around this this weaving of ideas or this (laughs) this complex you know combining two disparate elements or many disparate elements into something so let's talk about the weaving a little bit and and how that process feels for you and, 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 and where it's coming from. So, yeah, I started doing kind of collages with my inkjet prints and at first it was just playing around with it. And then my professor actually was, he actually said like, okay, you're weaving all these ideas together. Like what if you actually started like literally weaving the images Mm. And I was like, yeah, that maybe I should try that to see like, and at first it was just kind of another way to play around with the image. And um, I was kind of taking pictures of like very simple spaces that had like light beams in them. So it was very minimal and kind of abstract. Mm -hmm. But then once I like, cut into the paper and wove it together it gave it like this whole new life and I really really liked how I felt when I was like when it all came together Mm. because there's something to me like when I'm taking pictures it's like you're pushing a button especially if it's like not manual Um, you're pushing a button and then you put the image in a digital form and then you print it out and I just wanted to like do more to the image. I wanted to like actually like put my hands on it and create something like using my hands instead of just mm-hmm. just being solely uh, technology. And so when I was doing that, it was kind of like I had an idea of what it would look like when I was done weaving it. But every single time it always comes out like kind of a surprise mm-hmm. and like there is an idea of what it will look like, but it's really, it's like an exciting process for me. Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes back to like, you know, like getting your film developed, like you might <laughs> forget like what you've taken. And then you're like, <laughs> like I would be so excited to like see my, my film and see what I had on there and what images I thought were good. So like, I feel like with the weaving, it kind of brings back this excitement that I, I don't get from digital yeah. Like I can take a picture and look at it and have like an immediate like satisfaction or like, okay, that's what it looks like. But there's this delay when I'm weaving it that um, that's it, an exciting part of the process for me. And I'm I'm really curious on the process itself. And I'm sorry, Rick, if you were maybe about to ask this, nope. but like, how do you decide like physically, like how to cut? how to physically like I'm going to cut it in these ways and weave in these ways, like the physical decisions (laughs) that create an image that almost feels like improv or something, you Mm -hmm. know, but like, like where, where do you make those choices to cut? And maybe that's something you want to keep secret from, you know, behind the artists, (laughs) keep that behind the drapes. (laughs) But yeah, I'm just curious, like how you make those decisions to like, because there's very clear, it's not very, it's not uniform from this image particularly i feel like it's it is but it's like it's it's different sizes yeah yeah so early on it was i was using a uh, exacto knife and i was cutting um like a a half inch strips so that makes pretty much like uh like half inch squares that are all the same size basically Mm -hmm. and i do like how that turned out and then when I got better at the weaving, because at first it would take me like a really long time and my (laughs) hand and arm would be sore. And it is kind of like physical, like my, like I would sit a certain way and my body, like my legs would get sore (laughs) if I did it for too long. Yeah. Totally. So I had to like take breaks and stuff, but I, I switched over eventually to a box cutter, which is, way nicer and it feels better in my hand and like Mm -hmm. I can do it faster with a box cutter and so when I was like really comfortable with the actual like cutting and weaving then I started kind of playing around with um the different patterns that I could make Mm -hmm. 
so like for this one in particular and that one too like both of them are kind of the same pattern mm -hmm. uh i would those are like quarter inch strips and then i would do like cut two of those and then uh like a inch part so it was like two quarter inch and then an inch and then okay. two quarter inch and an inch and it's interesting to kind of see how that like pattern kind of uh presents itself when you're working on it because this i i would cut the both both of the images the same but some of them you know you can basically do whatever pattern you want depending on how you cut it mm -hmm. yeah and and we can see that the it, i think one of the things that definitely comes up for me is is the uh, i mean the the craft that you're putting into the the weaves as we go from here to here but then as we get into these i think it becomes like really clear to me that you've gotten you've really grown in your skills as far as like uh how precise these cuts are how precise these weaves are um which i hadn't seen a lot of these but they they are getting really precise and really kind of like complex at the same time i know i've wondered like if i have some kind of ocd with that <laughs> but actually the it's actually a very like tranquil process for yeah. me it's kind of like it's kind of like meditative in a way, like, because I can kind of like, I've already kind of done the creative part with the collages. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just kind of doing this, um, like repetitive task that I can kind of adjust things and make it like, like if I didn't like how a certain section looked, I could kind of redo it. Mm -hmm. But I just kind of liked the whole like mundane, repetitive process of it, and it like it is really tedious, but I enjoy that about it. So, you know, people ask me, they're like, "How do you do this? Like, that would take so long." Because I've done like some really like large scale pieces that mm -hmm. are actually like the quarter inch strips. Oh wow! And yeah, it does take a long time, but that I like that about it. I like. I like that repetitive aspect. Yeah. Um, Bognarly in the chat says, love this one, Space Gun Camp. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Nico says, totally different conceptually, but I think Emily would love Alma Hasser. I'm not familiar personally. Are you familiar? Um, Alma Hasser. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. doesn't ring a bell. I yeah, love that I you're writing know. this down because I also take notes throughout the show and I was like, wait, am I the only one that <laughs> yeah. does this? Here's um, some I just, from Alma here. You oh, can see. oh, yeah. I can see some like woven things in there. Yeah. So we have that note. Maybe I have, maybe I have seen some of their work on Instagram. Yeah. Thanks, Nico. Go well, ahead, Jake. Emily, I just want to say like one more thing of this is like, you know, Rick's commenting. I, I really enjoy like, you know, the sort of uh, geometric uh, precision of it. It's getting more complicated over time, but I think it speaks a lot to like the process that you've talked about this whole time that to me, it's, it doesn't look surgical though. Like it doesn't look super exact, but it definitely is geometric. Like mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. it, there's very clearly a pattern. There's very clearly like so much time has been put into this. And, and I, I would, I'm, I, I love everyone's work that we've seen so far on this show, but this work in particular, I, I'm, I'm really regretting that seeing in person and really love to see it. Um, I, I feel like though at the same time it's it's not so like unbelievable that you took that time to do that. You know what I mean? That like it's like you can see some edge, you can see some uh like imperfection despite it all being extremely uniform, which I think speaks a lot to like your analog digital kind of combination. Like is is that something that you think about? Like it being like mathematical but not perfect or is is I, I don't know if that's ever been part of your process necessarily i'm trying more and more to like maybe do things that aren't so precise like that's why like more recently i've been like showing the edges and like these are cropped so you can't really see but like some of my works like i actually have like some parts of it like sticking out that are different lengths yeah. so like I kind of like the unevenness of that but 
also I do kind of like my brain like tries to <laughs> tries to fight against that because I like if this like if the weaving was crooked like it would drive me crazy sure so I've been trying to kind of like let loose a little and let it kind of be more organic but I guess like I just like things like in in like the weaving to be very like exact <laughs> for sure absolutely yeah so Nico and i'm better i'm sorry you can continue sorry, <laughs> sorry. i was gonna say I'm, I'm better at doing it now because before if i like messed up one cut if my hand like slipped a little then like basically the whole thing is off and mm. i i would like redo it because it wow it just didn't look right. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. I got a couple of comments here in the chat. Nico says, um, the way that you censored, censored that one piece reminds me of Larry Sultan's Project The Valley. And also helpful to tell me that it's not Twitch friendly. Um, so thanks for that, Nico. Um, but yeah, this I think this one speaks to that, that question of like exactitude uh, or like intention in the the method of cutting this work because this one is like cut perfectly so that it's it does have this censorship quality to it like the 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 weave like distorts things enough that we feel um i i mean i feel comfortable putting this on twitch because i don't like consider this you know i i consider this censored in a way um but it yeah, is I also like on to... that line <laughs> Definitely strategically placed a few of those <laughs> uh, strips to cover cover some things up. <laughs> yeah, um, Nippon. Because I have had things taken down on Instagram before. Oh, uh, okay. So I have to be careful. <laughs> Nippon Fan asked the question: How much time to create this? I think we were looking at this one, but I guess um, maybe some viewers are are curious: like, how much time to create some of these? So it starts with the collage and sometimes like it all just comes together and I can look at it and say like, I feel like this is done. Like I like how this aesthetically looks and mm -hmm. then I'll photograph the collage and then uh, like either print it or maybe distort it a little in Photoshop and then I'll print two. And sometimes I do print the same image twice mm -hmm. and then I weave it because then you can really tell like what it is. It is like manipulated a little bit, but um, like this one in particular that, that's up right now is it's two different collages. And I don't know if you can tell there's like a hand like over mm -hmm. a face in the middle. Mm -hmm. But some of them are like a little hard to like see what's going on because it's just like distorted in so many different layer or so many different parts of my process mm. but the weaving itself um like the smaller pieces i can crank out pretty quickly like if i don't mess it up at all like cutting it might take like an hour or two and then weaving might take like an hour if i if it's a smaller piece mm -hmm. um and like I'll still, it still kind of is physically draining because I'll like I have to kind of like lean into the piece as I cut it, mm -hmm. um, and so like my arms and legs, if I'm like sitting in a weird position, will get sore, so I'll have to like take breaks. But if I need to get something done for a show, then I can I'll push myself to <laughs> get it yeah. done faster. But yeah, I think it's it a just good, depends on the size. A good opportunity to also kind of like i i like to mention this i like to stand up for artists is that like the time it takes to make it like is sometimes like disjointed from the effort that it takes to make it and and like right. doing this in four <laughs> hours like that's a heavy four hours you know like that's that's like two work days you know sometimes when i make when i'm working on a piece it's like oh man that hour felt like four because i was like really <laughs> really there so thanks for being open about how much time it takes i know some artists are concerned about sharing that because there's this idea that it devalues the work because sometimes these things right. that we make can be really quick but they are also very very valuable 
Um, you know, some of my paintings, yeah. I can only work on them. I actually only physically work on them for less than an hour, but it takes me weeks mm -hmm. and weeks to actually prepare the surface and to get exactly, it to that right yeah. point, <laughs> you know? So that's, it's, it's kind of an interesting interplay there. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, I think it's all about like what's in your head too. Like it might've taken months of like, you know, or years of life experiences to like get a pen and paper and draw this drawing that might take an hour, but it's like, it has such an impact on it. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I don't I think time that. necessarily. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's cool to know like the, the physicality of it though. And I think that's, that's kind of what mm -hmm. Nippon Te fan was asking is like the physicality of doing it. Cause I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't guess how long you could have said 10 hours or two yeah, hours and real. it would have mm -hmm. the, you know, 20 hours and it would have the same kind of like value to me. It's just like yeah. the materiality of that is I've, I've never woven anything in my life. never even got into the, like the little rubber bands as a kid or, or the, you know, like the beads, <laughs> like I never even got into that. So I have no frame of reference for creating, yeah. creating no something in that way. Or anything. Yeah. I've Not gotten in, very gotten good at it definitely awesome. like kind of perfect. i was just gonna say yeah. like it's, and, i imagine with time you just get faster you know uh -huh. at some point yeah mm -hmm. and i've had people say like why don't you just uh put it in a paper shredder yeah <laughs> and i have tried that i did try that and okay. it was like my dad's paper shredder i was like yeah i'm gonna put a photograph in here and I looked at the pieces and they were all like these little tiny triangles. Like he had like upgraded his paper shredder oh, no. to where it like shreds like <laughs> into Cross oblivion. shreds, yeah. Like yeah, confetti. and I was like, well, all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean. Do, but I don't. When you There's get like big. not a paper shredder big enough anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you're like, when you're famous and we're happy to be here, you know, just before your international rise to fame. But, yes. uh, you know, maybe there, maybe there are like, because the problem with the shredder was, was that like, it would be uniform. Like you'd be like a uniform size when you're working with like multiple different sizes here. Mm -hmm. But I wonder yeah. if there are types of like material processing. I'm sure there are in some ways that you could like set right. the variances and have the these. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Just this huge, <laughs> like variable shredding machine, but then you'd have to consider it just easier to do it by hand still probably. For sure. <laughs> if I like, I, I want to do some more like large scale pieces and I might explore some options with that. Cause that does take a long time. Like if it's mm -hmm. a large scale piece, um, the one that I made with the quarter inch strips, like mm -hmm. that one took me months because I'm just like every single day I was like spending hours just like cutting these strips and mm -hmm. then like I had to like attach them and to attach them to other strips and then weave them. Mm. So the bigger you get, the yeah, the longer the process. So maybe I need to find a... yeah. Uh, a, like industrial sized paper cutter <laughs> not to get into too much shop talk here and we're going to take yeah. a break here in a second but um i was thinking what you could do is you could potentially have like a like a vinyl cutter like a vinyl router with a with a cutting nib on it and you could feed that piece of paper into it with the vector points of where you wanted those slits to be and it would feed the paper in and out and, and slit it which um could be really cool i love vinyl cutters uh, those kind of like automated machine cutters. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's the first yeah, that thing that would, comes to mind. That would be nice to have for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. So, um, yeah, if you guys are good, well, let's, um, let's take our second break here. The th question that I had that wasn't immediately clear to me was these images that you're cutting and weaving together. These are, are these digital collages that you're making first and then cutting them up or I, I guess I'm confused as to like what the images are pre cut. Yes. Um, so it depends. Like sometimes they are like a collage I've made with like found imagery and like magazines. And sometimes I make collages with like some 
images I cut out and then mixed with some of my like mixed media work. Mm. So it's kind of just like whatever I feel like, like if I'm like experimenting with some different types of paper or something like sometimes it'll just come together mm. and then I'll photograph it. Okay. And then sometimes I do make digital collages where basically my found imagery comes from the internet mm -hmm. and I'll like distort the image in some way or like basically chop it up in a digital format mm -hmm. and then print that out and then use like either another digital collage or um, an actual collage I made by hand or sometimes it's even photographs that I have shot digitally. But there's usually some sort of distortion in there. I see. Like even if it's an image um, that I've shot on a digital camera, mm -hmm. like usually I will somehow create different layers with different types of media mixed in there. For nice. sure. Yeah, yeah, I I think that that definitely answers my question. Um, even without revealing too much, I think I think the the obscured the you know the weaving obscures in this interesting way, and then and then not exactly knowing where the source imagery is or coming from um, <laughs> yeah. is really nice. I mean, really nice visually. It allows me to just kind of enter into these um, uh, visual surfaces like with a baby mind, with like a young man's mind, not where I'm, you know, coming in with any kind of, any kind of knowledge. Um, I think that, that that's really powerful. Um, and I did also think it was important to talk about community a little bit and, and kind of like the community that you have when we were talking, um, in preparation for the show, something that you kind of kept bringing up is, is the artist community in St. Louis or like the Cherokee street community. Um, which is uh, kind of like a cool, fun, hip borough here in St. Louis City, um, that that's like really important to you, that that the artist communities and, and just kind of like the social communities are really important to you. I first met you at the Whiskey Ring just like super briefly because you were there with a friend that yeah, I have yeah, and, I and we we're just mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it's just like that's that's where it is all kind of taking place for you right now it's that that area or that community yeah it definitely like i felt like a sense of loss you know coming out of school and not having like peers that were also artists that were like we were helping each other out and critiquing each other like even if you like didn't get along with the people it was still like constructive mm -hmm. to have a critique and and even especially with people you might not necessarily be hanging out with in the real world you know that's kind of like where you get the best feedback sometimes mm -hmm. because you wouldn't normally you know be talking to that person about your work necessarily so mm -hmm. I do think there is a great like art community here um and always like been trying to support my friends as artists and musicians because there's like local shows i mean not right now but before um and you know just like making sure there's like a good community and maybe like some kind of collaborations here and there mm -hmm. and just like and you know a, a way to talk about art with different artists around here um so this this is a great platform to kind of put some local artists on the map that maybe uh, people aren't familiar with. Yeah. That's what Rick was fishing for, for the record. He was just like, yeah. I'm looking for <laughs> compliment. Thank I've you. been playing a lot of chess, so I was, <laughs> I was just thinking, I just, I, oh, yeah. I took my, I took my, uh, you know, took my knight to, to D3 and the Rick just really offensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really got this thing going. Um, Rick's gambit. <laughs> no, yeah, but I, I mean, I appreciate that, and and that's that's one of the things that like, I, I, I mean, you know, I, this is getting to like gas up time of the show. The the last the last is like we just start gassing each other up, like and, mm -hmm. but like you know, Jake and I, thinking about having you on the show, we're like, Emily is like, I, I mean, I think your work is is 
definitely worthy of all that you've received as a response to it, but it's worthy of like a lot Thank more. You. And, and like you showing internationally and, and you moving into these different spaces, like this work is so good. It's so good. And just like hitting you up to me, us not having a relationship was like, Ooh, maybe, I mean, I really love her work <laughs> and like, hopefully this makes sense and fits inside of what you're trying to do. But also like Jake and I want to, you know, signal boost people who we think are like not getting, not getting their dues, you know, like I think that they're that like you deserve more for what you're doing right now. So hopefully this is an opportunity to connect Thank that to a, wi a wider audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. And I'm like so happy you reached out to me and like, I was talking to you before when you first reached out and I was like, yeah, maybe it would be a good thing to talk a little bit more about my work. Like, cause I, if I'm posting on Instagram, like sometimes I'll just like quote an Ace Ventura quote that really has <laughs> nothing to do with the work at all. It's just like random. <laughs> and so people might be like, I don't know what the hell she's talking about, but uh, it's We've nice to, you know. Quoting. Yeah, we need to talk about that. We need a section for that. I know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, and I, I just I just felt like as as we dive deeper into it, like there is a lot more that we can go into and there is a lot deeper that we can go in this conversation. And I warned you about this, you know, prior to the show is that like an hour and a half is not enough, but it is something and we have to like, right. you know, recognize and appreciate that. But we're definitely not at the end of like how deep somebody can go into your work, uh, how, how people can look at your work and study your work. Um, and that, that's definitely a sign of good things to come. Cause if we went through like an hour and a half and we we're like, okay, yeah, it's pretty clear. It's probably a bad sign. <laughs> you know, the work is speaking for itself and, and speaking in a, in a lot of these different in in super interesting ways. I like, I was like just reading your artist statement, uh, in, in connection with the work just clarified so much for me. And I think, I think that it's really powerful stuff and, and we appreciate you sharing in such a vulnerable way. Thank you. Well, I have, I'll say, I just have one last question before we pivot to our, our questions of triumph. Um, mm -hmm. How often is, what is the scale of these pieces typically? I, I meant to ask this much earlier and I apologize, especially, especially post the complementative gas up phase, mm -hmm. but, um, but what is the typical like, like size of these pieces on, on a wall? So this one is about, it's about 12 by 18 oh. inches. Like, yeah. I have a printer that can print 13 by 19. Okay. Um, but, like, the picture that you have on the travel agency, like, Instagram page of mm -hmm. me standing next to that piece, like, mm. that one is, um, you know, it's much bigger, but... I basically print it in segments so I can do like any size. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have to like divide it up in Photoshop and print sections and then kind of build it like that. If I'm doing a larger scale piece, Gotcha. but a lot of them are typically like the size of this one. Okay. Um, just because that's like, that's a good size for me to do like at home and, have a nice frame for it and i do kind of like doing even smaller than that too and like i like displaying things in like grids mm. so Makes sense. if i have yeah. like a lot of like little ones then i can put them all in a grid and like i think the aesthetic of that looks really good for sure mm -hmm. well and i was curious too because a lot of these pieces are being shown with like no sort of um i guess dead space around them to kind of fully mm -hmm. conceptualize like when the piece ends sort of mm -hmm. which i thought was right. really interesting because obviously there's a lot of folks that will have like the piece and then kind of it on a wall physically or just like kind of give you a sense of the, the scale of it and maybe even put the dimensions in the description but um seeming these pieces at least you know viewing it through the show i'm sure maybe on instagram you have those descriptions but um you know you're you're capturing them just as the the piece themselves it's it's no no space to conceptualize the size of it which i i i was curious yeah, if that maybe was an should be doing that. well no no and that's fine i was like, just curious if that was something that you and you and did intentionally i mean i like how it looks on the social page but also 
Um, like I do need to move in a direction where I have like my own, like, uh, my own Instagram or some kind of social platform where it is like that, where you can see more of the scale and like, like, I guess, um, that would be more for like a marketing side of my work sure. because it is kind of unclear and I kind of like the ambiguity of that yeah. in a way, but also like if, if I want to like sell more of my work, which I do, and I'm very bad at marketing and <laughs> I'm very bad at that side of it, but, um, to have like images that are on a wall that people can look at and say, okay, it's this big, I can see the scale and I know what size it is. And I know how much it is and then could like buy it from that. Totally. So well, I'll be even... working on that. No, for sure. And, and by no means do I mean to say like, uh, Emily, you got to really work on your marketing, you know, but like, <laughs> I, know. I, think I that, need to for real. That. <laughs> I, I would almost say that's like the most common artist problem that we should just call it the artist. Right. Problem. Yeah, it the is. It what, really is. But, um, but no, but that's really interesting to know for sure. Cause I, 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 I do think it, it forces the, the viewer to kind of stay in the universe a little bit by not giving us the, any sort of dead spaces. It's almost like I, my brain kind of fought it a little bit. And then hence why I'm asking you the question is that so many mm. folks tend to add the, the kind of universe outside of the piece too. And you're not letting us mm -hmm. do that. And I, I think that's really, that's really creative and cool, whether intentional <laughs> or not, you know, I think that's really, that's yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. And, and those things continue to grow as we grow into our roles as artists and, and like, you know, the, the marketing of it is, is something that has to come, but it can feel strange at first. I know I experience this all the time. Yeah. I'm just like, continuing to put myself out there more and more and it's like well nobody's really coming yet but so it kind of feels bad but then also it's like yeah yeah well at some point like somebody wants to do it you know I, I tell this anecdote all the time is that like uh a couple weeks ago Tiffany and I wanted to buy something buy a print from an artist that we like in St. Louis but we didn't know who and we just really wanted like another one because that sensation of of buying work from local artists is like such a good one. So if, if people yeah. haven't had that experience, like go get you that experience. Cause it's all good. <laughs> but like, then we were like, Oh, like which one of our friends that makes work that we really like, can we buy something from right now? And there weren't as many, yeah. there like weren't as many options as you think. And it's like, Oh, I'd really like something from this person, but they don't have a store and I really don't feel like DMing them right now. It's like, you know, there are going to be those opportunities as we, we move forward and they might not be like immediately flooded when it first comes in, but having that space for people and having, having that kind of like ability for people to love you in that way, I think it becomes more and more important as we, as we grow into our roles as, as artists. Uh, but it takes time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bog Gnarly says, yes, we love instant gratification. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I just want to buy something. <laughs> Sometimes I'm feeling it. And if I can buy something from the homies rather than buying something from, like, Amazon, then that's that's all love. Gets us one step yeah. closer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it was Small Business Saturday just yesterday, and we're... We can be our own small I know, businesses, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it just it feels weird sometimes. So we just yeah, we'll get used to it. We'll get there. 